Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you are all doing well. Uh, we are starting our next lecture today. Um, this is the second to last lecture in this unit, so we're almost done. Um, sorry, I have someone here who has to play with everything on the desk. Um, maybe she'll come say hi, probably not. Anyway, before we get started, um, I wanna make a little announcement, which is a weird announcement to make, and it's a weird announcement not to make in person, but here we are. Um, so I will not be coming back to Hamilton next year. I'm still hoping to come back this year. Um, I'm doing a lot better, but uh, definitely not at a place where I could be at school. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna come back next year. Um, this is actually something I had decided before I got sick. Um, and then it just like has gotten all <laughs> confusing with me being sick. Um, but yeah, um, I theoretically have told the school um, we have to submit like a little form of intent um, and like back in the very beginning of February, I turned mine in saying I wasn't coming back. However, nobody's talked to me about it. So I don't know if they've looked at those forms yet. <laughs> so maybe people at school know and maybe they don't. Um, but I, I'm at a point now where I don't care if this is a secret or not. So don't feel like you have to keep it a secret. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure if if I'm going to keep teaching or not. Um, and Bert. Bert. What are you doing? She's like digging in the couch, being all weird. Sorry. Um, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to continue to be a teacher. I kind of think I am not, um, which is something I never thought uh, would happen to me. I really thought I was always going to be a teacher. Um, but it's kind of gotten to a point where, you know, if the past two years haven't shown people like the importance of education and what we go through as educators, um, I don't think anything will. And I don't think... I can do anything to fix that. And, you know, the first 10 years of being a teacher, I was kind of okay with knowing that I wasn't making a huge difference, but it, maybe I was making a difference for my students or, hey, leave that tissue alone. Don't, you can't eat a tissue. Hey, 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 hey. I think there's a tissue box in the cushions. Bert, come here. Yeah, leave all of that alone. There you go. Okay, I'm sorry. Leave it to me to try to have like a serious announcement and they have a cat messing with tissues. Um, but yeah, for a long time, I felt like, you know, even if I made a difference every year for one student that like, that was enough. And I'm not saying that that isn't enough, um, but it kind of isn't enough anymore. Um, and frankly, I'm not sure if anything in education, hold on. Okay. Um, is going to change until like, frankly, all the good teachers are gone. And I do think I'm a good teacher. Um, 
please don't let me know if you disagree. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just can't do it anymore. So yeah, I don't know. I think I thought that little speech would be more eloquent, but Bert helped me with that. Um, I don't think there's anything I'll say really needed to say. Um, I didn't tell you for so long because I was like, oh, I should let all the humanities teachers know first. Um, and like the week that I left school being sick was the week they decided to start having in-person SLC meetings. So I couldn't go to the meetings. Um, and that's what I was gonna do that, that first week. I was gonna be like, okay, I'm not coming back like in a Zoom and um, I can't do that. <laughs> So, um, but I kind of don't care anymore because, <laughs> and it's petty, um, but I don't really think I owe anybody anything when, like, obviously aside from Miss Molina, only one teacher has reached out to me to ask if I'm okay. <laughs> so, whatever. Um, I don't know if there's going to be an art history program next year. I mean, you guys don't have an English teacher. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. I hope there is one. And, um, yeah, I don't know. It doesn't, it's not really going to affect you guys. It's going to affect the 10th graders more, but, uh, that's that. Okay. Romanticism. Let's get started. That, I do need this. Bert has gone. She has left. I can hear her eating now. So she just wanted to be here for my big announcement. <laughs> and now has left. Okay. Cool times. All right. So romanticism. Here it is. Um, clicky, clicky. There we go. I mean, I guess like write this stuff down. I don't know, but like pause. Although my my little picture is blocking some of it, isn't it? Okay, well, I don't know. I, I gotta post this lecture and the last lecture anyway, so. Um, oy, my eyes won't stop watering. Okay, I think I got something in this one. Romanticism, here's a definition of it. An intellectual, cultural, and artistic movement that went against the rationalism of the enlightenment and instead emphasized emotion and subjectivity. Okay. So this is more than just art, like visual art. Um, you know, there are famous romantic musicians, Beethoven, Chopin, um, and then writers, Victor Hugo, he did um, Les Mis. Did he also write The Hunchback of Notre Dame? <laughs> I don't know. Why do I think he did? Um, Herman Melville, that's Moby Dick, right? And then Edgar Allan Poe, he has all those weird poems. Um, you know, the Raven, uh-oh. Sorry, if you can hear that, I hope she stops playing with it. Sometimes she will just do that for like 20 minutes straight. If she, if she I, I think she's moving on. Okay. I'm sorry, uh, romanticism. There are like these three categories of aesthetics that I don't know, have to do with romanticism. We don't, we don't really focus on them. There's beauty qualities relating to formal harmony, uh, picturesque qualities re relating to texture, lighting, composition, and engaging formal irregularities. And then sublime qualities relating to intangible awe and a feeling of being overwhelmed. Again, I'm not going to bring up any of these terms in this entire lecture, but like there they, there they are. Bert, can you do anything else, please? Thank you. I don't know if you could hear that or not, but it is so annoying. Like I hate that toy, but oh, she loves it. Don't I have anything for you? Ooh, we have a laser pointer. Oh, what's this? There we go. Go play with something else. Okay. 
Um, great. Here are some examples of very famous pieces of uh, romantic art. And, and I, I will say, before we start looking at stuff, the hardest thing about romanticism is to not think that it has to be romantic as in like valentine's -y, right? It's not about like love or like buying people flowers, I don't know. Um, it d Try to get that out of your head because like, oh boy, does this not, this, this is a Valentine's day from my nightmares. Um, and in fact, it is called the nightmare. <laughs> so this is a very famous one though. Um, but I think we can see here that like, you know, I, I think a big thing to think of is like, this is kind of a reaction to the enlightenment, right? And so in the enlightenment, things are very like scientific. Um, people are trying to make social commentaries uh, and <laughs> some artists, some, you know, the romantic artists were like, screw that. <laughs> Like, let's make weird shit that makes people feel stuff. And a lot of the time it's like uncomfortable. So here's this, I hate it. Everybody is, everybody who teaches this course is always very surprised that this isn't in the 250. This is a very, very famous uh, painting, The Raft of the Medusa. And it's based on a real event. Any other toy any other toy why don't you take a nap it is definitely nap time and where's your sis she's napping huh? did you throw up on that carpet oh my god i just washed it i'm sorry you guys she's gone outside now so maybe she'll she heard the parrots oh my god i should start this lecture over um, oh my God, I can't believe she threw up on that carpet. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Just watched it. Yeah, so this boat, the Medusa sank and a little part of it survived uh, and that they called the raft and some people survived on it. I think everybody in the end died. I don't think anybody survived. Um, this one's very famous for romanticism, um, right? And the idea here, I think this is a good example, even though you kind of feel like, well, what's, what, what? <laughs> like, okay, it's a guy standing there. But like, if we sort of compare this to something of the enlightenment, so, you know, what did we have? Um, we had the philosopher and the orrery. We had um, the tete-a-tete. This, like brings you feelings. <laughs> this evokes feelings, that's a better way to say it. Um, but also there's, there's a subjectivity to it, right? If something is subjective, that means that like people can interpret it diff in different ways, right? If something is objective, then that means like there's one way to interpret something. Right. So people will say like things can be like objectively funny or subjectively funny. So like if something's objectively funny, everybody thinks it's funny. If, they, if something is subjectively funny, then like some people might not think it's funny. And so there's a real subjectivity to romanticism where like some people might look at this and feel sad, but some people might look at it and feel like hopeful or something or like wistful or, you know, I don't know. Um, but it, it kind of leaves that open to interpretation. William Blake, very famous romantic artist, um, like, what is this? <laughs> and then I always, this one's like very, very famous for romanticism, but I always showed this one in case any of you um, saw the movie, or I don't know what they, I think it is also a book, and I don't know if they actually talk about this, um, I think it's a print, uh, in the book or not, but if you saw the movie Red Dragon, um, it's like part of the Hannibal Lecter series, the spoiler alert, the bad guy like eats this, 
he like goes to the museum and like they pull out the print and then he eats it. Super weird. Okay. I just cannot believe she threw up on that little rug. She threw up on it like two weeks ago when I watched it. Like my entire apartment is hardwood floor and then like tile. But she always finds a rug. It's okay, I love you anyway. Oh, I'm so okay. Here we go. I wonder how far, I didn't even start a timer for how long we've been doing this. I'm sorry, I know it's been a slow start. <laughs> anyway, here we go. We're in Spain, we're in Madrid. That's where Madrid is, it's like in the middle. Okay. <laughs> Don't freak out. <laughs> you just have to know, and there's nothing to be done. This mostly actually goes by its, its English translation. Um, but you, you can decide if you want to memorize the Spanish or the English, and you do not have to know that it is from the Disasters of War uh, series or that it is plate, whatever. I can't even see it. Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. So this is Goya. Um, Goya is more famous for, well, actually, I don't know. He is, he is very famous for this series, but he was the court painter for um, the king of Spain. Hang on, I gotta, I have the wrong notes pulled up and I wanna get like the names of the people right. Um, okay, so um, yeah, he was the, court painter for Charles the fourth um, of Spain and this is during the time of Napoleon okay <laughs> so <laughs> so funny so Napoleon he tricked the king of Spain Charles the fourth um, he said to, to Charles the fourth Napoleon was like hey I want to go conquer Portugal um, and if you don't remember, oops, pardon me. Um, you know, Napoleon's here in France, here's Portugal. So Napoleon is like, can we just walk through Spain to go conquer Portugal? And Charles, Charles the fourth is like, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then like the minute they cross the border into Spain. They're like, actually, we'll take Spain too. And they do. They conquer Spain. Um, and they conquer it in an incredibly bloody and horrifying manner, as war tends to be. Um, and, uh, and now, Napoleon doesn't like name himself um, ruler of Spain, he puts his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, uh, in the, in the rule, and then, um, but Spain eventually does revolt, and, um, they have the Peninsular War, I don't think you need to know that, you don't need, you don't necessarily need to know any of this, well, actually, you do need to know about Napoleon taking over France, sorry, you don't need to know about like Joseph Bonaparte. Like who cares about Joseph Bonaparte? Nobody. Um, so yeah, anyway, it takes over. Um, and then they get rid of him in the Peninsular War, who cares? Um, now, Goya had been the court painter for Charles IV. And when Joseph Bonaparte showed up, um, he was like, you can either stay my court painter or we can kill you. <laughs> and so Joseph, Von, or I'm sorry. And so Goya was like, okay, yeah, I'll do it. And so he was then the court painter for Joseph Bonaparte. Um, obviously he was very highly criticized for this. Um, I mean, I don't know. 
I, I, I don't know how to interpret events like that. I, I honestly don't. Um, I think, I think it's very easy for those of us not in positions like that to be like, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't work for Joseph Bonaparte. But like, would you really? Would you really be like, yeah, fuck, kill me? I don't know. Um, I don't know. So, I don't know. I feel bad for him. Uh, he He's not really like criticized now for this. It's not something where we look back and we're like, oh, we hate Goya because he we don't really care about it now, partly because of these prints. Um, so yeah, uh, and, but like later he denied, um, not denied like working for him, but like denied, you know, sort of being a part of that um, court essentially. So anyway, um, I just wanna see, okay, so, uh, this is etching. So, <laughs> are there enough things that this is etching, dry point, burn, and burnishing? The burn and burnishing are really I should have erased, but I never remember to do shit like that. Um, basically, this is both the etching, which if you remember from last time or two times ago, who the fuck knows, uh, is where you take the metal plate, you put wax on it, you carve, you you slice away the wax or whatever you scratch away the wax and then you put it in um, acid and dry point is when you just like scratch it with metal metal on metal um okay so the date again you don't have to memorize this date but it is important to know that he worked on this series and this series included how many like 80 82 prints um, and he made them and then at some point he died sometime after, I don't know, in 23, after 23, who knows? Um, someone knows, I don't know. <laughs> and then like years and years and years after his death in 1863, someone found these in his possessions and they published them. So Goya had never actually intended for these to be published but I think it's good that they were um, because this entire series of, what did I say, 82? 82 images is all uh, like depictions of what happened in the war where France, where Napoleon took over Spain. Um, and some of them are like really heartbreaking. And it shows that like he clearly was not a fan but again, like, what are you going to do? Okay, so let's go ahead and look at this. Um, you've got this main figure here who is tied to a post and blindfolded. And you have this figure here who is dead. And you can actually kind of see it's really amazing in the, in the etching that, like, there is blood actually around his head. Um, and then you see in the background, these other figures tied to posts. And then you see these French soldiers, you know, they're French soldiers because they have this stupid hat. Um, and they have rifles and they're pointing the rifles at these two men. Um, but Goya does something really interesting here where you don't actually see the majority of the rifle. So like, you know what's gonna happen, but it's also kind of hidden. But then you finally notice that there are rifles right here. That there are at least three soldiers out of the frame who are pointing their rifles at this man. And that all these people are gonna be executed. Um, all these Spanish people are gonna be executed. And this was really, really common as the uh, what do you call it? Army rolled through Spain. Anybody who resisted in any way, they were just killed. Like citizens. These aren't soldiers. Um, they just would kill citizens sometimes. 
Um, and there's really something so heartbreaking about this, like the defeatedness of the main figure as well as this figure back here. Um, it even seems like this looks like, I think the leg of a third person. So they just like tie you to a pole, shoot you, untie you, kind of push you to the side and tie up another person. Um, I mean, this guy, I guess, at least gets the benefit of a blindfold. This person didn't. I'm guessing they didn't take a blindfold off this guy. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's very, I, I think even in something so simple as an etching, which, you know, we do t often think of as like simple, um, which it isn't, uh, you know, we know that it's a very complex process to make something like this, but I, I actually think it's better the simplicity because I think it lets that romantic <laughs> feeling that sounds so weird because like clearly this isn't romantic. Um, I'm, we're going to do, whenever I go romantic, I mean like Valentine's Day romantic, <laughs> um, but it's just, it's weird to say, but anyway, um, I think it lets the feeling come through in a very um, kind of clean and raw kind of way. Okay, I think I have some close ups. So, yeah, here's the dead guy. <laughs> Sorry. One thing that we'll even see in his paintings is that Goya is really good with emphasis. I'm gonna say this every single lecture until I finally do it. We need to do the lecture on the elements of art and principles of design. But basically emphasis is about like where your eye goes first, especially. Um, and sort of, and then it, you know, often involves movement about like, where does your eye go? And he does this so well through color and here through like the variation of black, white, and gray that like you, you so clearly start with this figure. But I think that this white area over here, this very empty area, like you, you are drawn also to these two areas. But this real openness here keeps your attention to this side so that it really does take you a moment to pick up on the rifles right here. Um, I think that's very powerful. And then <laughs> I took this picture a couple of years ago. I was walking through Trader Joe's and was like, what the fuck? There is a... Um, I don't think I have the other picture, but there's a wine company. Um, <laughs> they, they've done, I've seen two, but they've, and I, I, so every time I go now, not every time, um, cause I don't like wine, so I don't buy wine, but, and so I'm not in the wine section very often, but I do occasionally go and look and see if they've done new ones. And I really want to like contact this winery and be like, do you know? they've done two Goya prints. Um, but yeah, they call this one blindfold, but like they've clearly taken out some stuff. There isn't the figures in the background. You don't have the rifles. Like it's so weird. I love it. So yeah, there it is. So bizarre. Okay. Here is some other ones from this same series. Again, a lot of it ends up being French soldiers um, murdering civilians. So here again, it just looks like all these people like in anguish. And then at the end, you see the bayonets here. I think this one's really powerful. It's a French soldier attacking a young woman. And then this old woman is like coming to her rescue. I hope she stabs her. This one's very, very famous. Um, in fact, I think I'm going to show you the Yinka Shonabare. Yeah, <laughs> so Yinka Shonabare, um, he did a series of this 
where each one is named after a continent. Um, it's a whole thing, but it's cool. Okay. Here are some of his paintings though. Let's look at a couple of his paintings. So here is Charles IV and his family. So look at this baby. I never noticed that baby before, <laughs> but now I can't stop looking at it. That baby is so precious. And like the way it's looking at its mama is so cute. Oh my gosh. Um, precious. I really like his style. Very famous. Very famous. Um, I even last night, I was like looking through old um, TikToks that I had liked. <laughs> Sometimes I do that. Um, and I found one that was uh, this out of balloons, like a balloon animal. <laughs> yeah. So this is Saturn devouring his son so that's that's from greek mythology but this one is so so famous it's like if you've never seen this before you're gonna see it pop up sometimes now people like put it in weird places um so the third of may there was a terrible massacre the third of may of 1808 and um a couple of years ago, the AP test was for this class was set for May 3rd. Um, and like our history teachers were just, I wasn't teaching that year. It was the year before I was teaching, but they just went nuts for it. <laughs> There's also a May the 2nd and one year we also had a May the 2nd. <laughs> so there was this massacre that like happened over a couple of days. Um, but yeah, okay. So that's Goya. Liberty leading the people. I really wish I had started a timer. I don't know how long I've been going. I think I can do Liberty leading the people pretty quickly. So maybe we'll do this one and then another one. Um, all right, so we're in Paris. This is Delacroix. Um, and this is his most famous piece. Let me make sure I'm on the right notes for this. Okay. Um, so this is the... <laughs> I don't know how to say it in French. Trois gl glorious, I don't know, the three glorious days. I do know how to say three because Sesame Street taught me some of the French numbers. <laughs> um, but it's this is from uh, an event called the three glorious days. Excuse me. Um, which was a um, like three days in July. One of my neighbors was being loud outside. I didn't close the door. Um, in July, this is just the, And my leg is falling asleep. Okay. Okay. Um, so in July of 1830, uh, <laughs> France was having a revolution. Um, and during this part of the revolution, they replaced King Charles the Tenth, who was a member of the Bourbon family. I don't know enough about French history for this to make sense. And it doesn't matter for us. Okay, but they replaced King Charles the Tenth, who was a member of the Bourbon family. Don't know about that. Um and he was the younger brother of Louis the 16th, okay? So King Charles X, younger brother of Louis the 16th who had been beheaded and they replace him with Louis Philippe the I, the so-called citizen king. So um, now this uprising, this, I think we say uprising um, in 1830 was the, prelude okay was the like prequel 
to the rebellion of June of 1832, which that rebellion was the one from Les Mis, okay? Neither of which, like, I think do really anything, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, that's what we've got going on here. Okay. Suddenly I'm really tired, sorry. I'll stop yawning, okay. So, here we go, what have we got? First of all, title of this very important, Liberty Leading the People, because this is liberty, okay? She is an allegory for liberty, um, so she's not a real person, right? And you might be thinking, and this one you might actually be thinking, why are her boobs out? Like, hike it up, girl, what you doing? Um, <laughs> here's, here's what she doing. Uh, I usually, like usually we're in person. And so I, when I ask this question, it's really fun to see like, the gears turning in people's minds before they come up with the answer. Okay, what is the purpose of breasts? <laughs> People are like, God, this is a trick question. <laughs> okay, so it's not a trick question. The purpose of breasts is to nourish the young, not all the young, like probably your own personal young and like babies. Um, nourish the young sounds <laughs> too broad. It's for feeding babies, okay? And so um, this is an instance, if you think of like Liberty, right? She is, like if you've ever heard the term and you usually hear it about college, um, alma mater, right? Like my alma mater is live too. I have University of Michigan and Michigan State University. Um, but alma mater means nourishing mother. And so, again, I don't know why we like have at this point kind of, only applied that to universities, but that's kind of the idea going on here that like her boobs are out, not because this is sexual in any way, uh, but because like she is a like nourishing, saving figure, right? It's not about like fertility. Um, it's, it's about like nourishing, I don't know, anyway. So she got the French flag, she got a bayonet gun thing. Um, she also, the hat she's wearing is very important. Um, this is a Phrygian cap. I'm just trying to pull up the spelling for myself because you know I can't spell for shit. Um, I'm gonna spell it for you. Oops. What? Can we just start over? Okay, Phrygian. Um, Phrygian cap. So this actually goes back to ancient Rome um, that freedmen and women, but really the freedmen, uh, freed slaves which was like pretty common in ancient Rome to be a slave and then to be freed. Um, they often would wear these uh, hats. They were given one when they were freed. And um, it's a, a signifier of freedom. And uh, again, it's from ancient Rome, but like that would have been known at this time. It becomes like a, uh, a, a, a very well-known symbol of freedom, like throughout Europe and the Americas, um, the Phrygian cap, a symbol of freedom. So that's good. Um, okay, great. Oh, okay. I'm so out of it. Here's how big it is. <laughs> All right, there she is with her hat and her gun and stuff. Okay, these two guys, these two guys are actually pretty important. Um, 
these two dudes, you can very clearly see by their clothing that this man, that this man is higher class than this man, but he's not like the nobility, right? He's just slightly higher class. Um, you know, he's got, oh my God, my nose. He's got a top hat. He's got a nice waistcoat and overcoat. What's the jacket? I don't know, whatever. Um, whereas this guy, he's got just like a little like cap. That's not a Phrygian cap. That looks like a page boy cap, but he's got like overalls. He looks like a worker of some type. Um, and then also, okay, he has a sword, but he also has like a pistol. Whereas this guy, this is, this is, I don't think he, I would say it's a shotgun, but like, it's, that's the kind of gun that like the upper class use for like, you know, shooting pheasants or something, um, where it has like shot, right? Like pellets, um, so like you can shoot a person with this it's gonna hurt they could die if you like shoot them very close or i don't know it hits an artery or something but like people get shot with these all the time <laughs> because it's america um and don't die i mean like there's an episode of parks and rec where ron gets shot with one of these and he's fine um dick cheney shot some guy <laughs> one of these and i don't think he died um anyway okay God. so get back to the point Laven. the point is um that like you have these two men of very differing classes different worlds and yet they both right the lower class and even the upper class are there for revolution um, you know, I think you normally think of like a revolution uh, of overthrowing the upper class as being like the poorest of the poor, but it wasn't. Um, it was, it was everybody. I should watch Les Mis. No, actually, I don't. It's really depressing. There's this little kid, <laughs> like really is a little kid with like two pistols. <laughs> this, uh, this kid in this painting was the inspiration for um, Victor Hugo to write the role of the little kid in Les Mis. Um, you have this person who I can never decide if it's a man or a woman. Um, I always think it's a woman, but then I'm like, I don't think it's a woman, but like, I don't know. But like looking up at Liberty um, and, oh, Here's, okay, wait, I think I'm gonna have the full image again. So we'll come back to that lady, but here's Notre Dame Cathedral right here. It's here because it's, it, this image needs to have something that really like places us in Paris um, and nothing places you in Paris better than Notre Dame. And you know it's Notre Dame because like it, it's got these square, um, towers at the front you can even see the little flag here that's being held by Quasimodo no I'm kidding <laughs> but there is a flag there it's just not Quasimodo oh I don't have the full thing again okay well look Coldplay like made it a little cover in 2008 because why not um I'm not gonna go back to the whole thing <laughs> because this will do but you can actually see that they are like trampling over dead bodies like this is intense, right? I don't know if we've talked about this yet, but like parrots, um, the way that we often uh, engage in war in, nowadays is keeps you very removed. Like a lot of it is like drones and shooting off uh, rockets or what I don't really understand but like it's very little like hand-to-hand -hand combat or like crawling over the bodies of your dead compatriots so um you know a I mean like I'm not trying to 
diminish the effects of modern day warfare um, and and what and and what those effects on people can be. Um, but like it is a just a very different um, thing, I think. I don't know. What do I know? I don't know. Okay, here's some other Delcroix. Um, Christ on the Sea of Galilee. I don't know. This is a story of Jesus. I don't know. Well, lion hunt. Okay, great. Ooh, the oxbow. I love the oxbow. I really wish I knew how long we'd been doing this. I might just want to stop. <laughs> I know we've only done two and like that's not a lot but I love the oxbow so much and I feel like I'm not in the right headspace right now um so you might just have a short lecture I also really want to go put that rug in the washing machine I'm so mad okay anyway <laughs> I'm not really mad like she doesn't know I'm not mad at her I'm mad at the situation that I have to wash this thing now okay I'm gonna stop um, you didn't get a secret word. You didn't get one. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I'll post another one soon. Okay, bye.